morning. I'm understudying for him. He's done several favors in that line for me recently also, so it's a subject which fortunately I can handle, I believe. In the uh, problem of Atlantis, I think there are a number of points that have not been generally considered. We think of Atlantis as an island, probably somewhere in the Atlantic, and probably about in the location of the present Azores Islands. But actually, Atlantis was a diffusion. If you buy a map now of the world as it is today, we can say that that is the modern uh, distribution. But to have a map of Atlantis as it was in the time of its glory, you would have to have a map of the entire planet because it was a distribution. Continents rose and fell. Islands came up and went down. Great land shifts occurred. And the Atlantic distribution of land was far more important and far more far-reaching than the mere problem of an island somewhere in the ocean. So we have to think of Atlantis in relationship uh, to a complete pattern of the planet. As Plato clearly points out, the island of Poseidonis, which we now think of as Atlantis, was the last fragment of a great empire. It was the last surviving part and is supposed to have disappeared under the ocean about 12,000 years before the Tra Trojan War, which would make it about 15,000 years ago. Now, in connection with the problem of Atlantis, I think the next thing we have to study is the name. Plato refers to the mysterious empire as Atlantis. He probably received this name, or secured it, from Solon, who in turn had received it from the priests of the Egyptian temple at Sais. Now, the word Atlantis, or its root, is not Egyptian, and it is not Greek. No one seems to be able to trace the origin of the name. It appears on two very important phases of ancient mythology, Atlantis and Atlas. And the root is ATL, Atal. Now, if we look to find a language in which that word or that root is permissible or was used, we find we have to come to the Western Hemisphere because Atal was one of the month names of the Mayas. It also has more than just a name significance. Its glyph, or its symbol, is a deluge. This seems then to give us the real basis of our word, that we are dealing with a term that represents a world experience, that various countries were involved in it, that the circumstances were known around the entire planet and that the name that has survived to us today is probably based upon the records on the Western Hemisphere. Now, if we take the general term to represent this mysterious region, we then can find from the Codex Troano, uh, which is in the museum in Madrid, one of the surviving documents of the Mayas, that this particular deluge is marked in the glyphs of the people. The story is told in pictures, but among these pictures there is one in which the sky dragon or the sky serpent is pouring water from its mouth, and below this the god of death is dancing on the earth. Now this was a long time ago, uh, long before the coming of the Spaniards, but the records even go much further than that. According to the Chinese, the previous existence before our present coming to this earth uh, was destroyed. The previous world was destroyed by water, a tremendous deluge. And in the I Ching, the eight trigrams, basic trigrams, correspond to Noah and his wife, their three sons and their three wives, were the eight who were saved. 
And this is exactly what the Chinese tell us. So the story goes around here and there and everywhere. It's a very interesting story, but what does it really mean? Is it merely an archaeological curiosity, or does it have some dynamic value for us today? I would like to think of uh, Atlantis much as Lord Bacon did in his book, The New Atlantis, in which he says in very simple terms, the New Atlantis, which is America. Bacon was quite convinced that on the Western Hemisphere, a great empire would arise, an empire that would surpass the glory of the Atlantean story, and that this new world would not be destroyed. It would not turn against the gods. It would not misuse the energies of nature, and as a result, it would become a new world, a restoration of the golden age. Now, when we study this Atlantean problem a little more carefully, we realize there have been a number of speculations on this. Vice President Dawes uh, made quite an extensive search for the Atlantean world. A number of good archaeologists and ethnologists have devoted time to it, and the general attitude is no longer to discard it as a fable, but to try to find out what its actual meaning could be. Now, let us suppose that Solon was correct, and that Solon, being an old man, was unable to do what he had intended to do, and that was to write out an account of the lost Atlantis, as he found it, or it was given to him, in the caves under the Temple of Sais in Egypt. Here on columns formed of oracalcum, a metal that cannot perish, was recorded the story of a lost world. This, these two tablets are sometimes referred to as the Tables of Enoch, and we find a great deal of mystical lore surrounding this story. In any event, Solon, being very old and unable to carry on the work, now passed the legend on to one of his descendants, who, who was a student of Plato's. And this student, in turn, told Plato, who took the story, to use it as a great symbolical account of the descent of man. Now, Plato does not deny that the story is literally true, but he does point out so many very subtle and unusual details that we are forced to realize that he embellished it to represent the entire story of the planet Earth and its development. According to Plato, at a remote time, the gods of High Olympus distributed the world to their various sub-deities, and to Poseidon was given the lands of the sea, the great oceans, and the islands, and the archipelagos, and Poseidon created his kingdom in the oceans, and he created a wonderful city called the City of the Golden Gate, and in this city there was the temple to him, and in this temple were the tablets containing the laws of life, the laws that must be obeyed if man is to survive and to enjoy the favors of the gods. And the Atlantic Empire consisted of seven islands. These seven islands also occur in the Mexican story. These islands came together to form a league, and this league in turn created a kind of empire. And in the course of ages, the princes of the islands of the Atlantides uh, became very proud. They decided that they would conquer the world. So in order to achieve this great end, they decided to send expeditions of conquest over all the other parts of the then Atlantean distribution. Now this distribution at that time uh, consisted, much as it does today, of countries of various degrees of development. It was not an uninhabited world. The Atlanteans were not the only people. But these other people were comparatively primitive. They were like the natives of Africa or the natives of some Polynesian area or perhaps the natives of some distant islands of the South Pacific. They were primitive people. 
but they existed. And the Atlantean merchants went to them, tra traded with them, and bartered with them. Plato states definitely that Atlantis had a great mercantile, that it traveled to all parts of the world, that it even visited Europe and as far south as South America. But gradually this empire grew more and more proud. Gradually fame, wealth, and power became the great objectives for life. And there was another dimension. These peoples possessed extrasensory perceptions that had not yet been closed by the process of embodiment. They were like the extrasensory perceptions of small children in whom faculties are partly active, which are now dormant in our racial groups. So in any way, these magicians, these sorcerers, uh, these powerful ones who possessed Vril, Vril being the one motive power that is inexhaustible, something we could use today, if that we'd uh, carry anything, transport anything, activate anything, that the human being could conceive. And so in their pride, these princes decided, near the end of their time, to invade what uh, is now Europe. They decided to invade uh, in the areas of the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Near East. So they sent great fleets to conquer these countries. countries. In the meantime, the deities, uh, particularly Poseidon, realizing what was occurring, gave warnings and sent prophets and told these people they were destroying themselves, but they were proud and they gave no mind or no thought to consequence. And finally, they rebelled against the gods and the gods reacted accordingly. In a single night, the great center of Atlantean culture, the island of Posidonis, the last surviving fragment of an ancient order of life, disappeared under the ocean and, according to the Maya calendar, carried with it to death 60 million human beings. This was the end of a great cycle of misuses and abuses in which those powers, forces, and principles which had been intended to be of common good to all mankind were perverted and in one way or another turned against the will of heaven and in consequence was they were destroyed. Now this also causes us to have another little interlude here which I think we should give a thought to. We are told by Plato and several other historians of the type of the time that various agencies, various merchants, travelers, explorers from Atlantis visited other lands. And among those who visited other lands were the priests of the Atlanteans, those who worshipped the great golden serpent. Serpent worship was one of the oldest religions of the world. Now these various missionaries, shall we say, went to primitive people as we send missionaries today to underprivileged or gradually evolving groups. And these missionaries set up various institutions uh, in the distant parts of the empire, the parts that were not actually destroyed by the destruction of the Atlantean centerland. Now, it seems to me, and I, I realize that this is hypothetical, but it seems to me that this explains a series of legends and myths which are of interest. We are told, for example, that the people of Chaldea and Babylonia were very primitive, that they had not yet discovered the use of fire, that they did not know how to cook food, they did not know how to keep records, they had no medicinal, medical knowledge, they had no laws to live by and no governments except tribal communes. And in the midst of all this time, while they were living along the shores of the sea, one day something strange happened. A being came out of the sea. This being whom they called Oanis had the body of a fish and the head of a human being. 
and wore on his head the head of a fish on end. If you see the old pictures, you realize that his hat was what we call today a mitre, which is practically exactly the shape of a fish's head. And this man who came out of the sea had scales. Now, scales could very well represent armor. He carried symbols with him. And he was a good man. And he came to these people. And he taught them. He gave them a written language. He gave them the knowledge of agriculture. He taught them astronomy and the mystery of the stars. He helped them to build a permanent government. Introduced them into the mysteries of architecture and the building of cities. And he also taught them the mysteries of heaven and the ways of the gods, and taught them to live in obedience. And he told them that in due time he would return. And then he went back to the sea, promising to come back one of these days, sometime in the, near, in the future. And he walked out into the sea and disappeared. Now this seems to me to be a veiled story, could be a veiled story, of an Atlantean traveler a missionary, perhaps, who came to these people very much as the Chaldeans coming along the coast of Brittany and, Fra and France gave them uh, the beginnings of the culture of the Druids. This one who came out of the sea, he dressed in armor, probably came on a ship, which came over the horizon and was regarded as evidence that he came out of the sea. The most important thing, I think, in this legend is that he promised to return. So they waited. And they kept his laws and they kept his rules for years. But he never came back. Now, on the opposite side of the world, something else was happening. The people of Central America were living in a very primitive state. Some of them were cannibals. They had no homes except rude huts. They had no instruments except cuts, cut from stone. They did not know how to cook their food. They had no written language and no way of recording their history, no knowledge of any of these things. And while they lived in this primitive condition, a strange thing happened. An old man came to them riding on the back of serpents. And he came to the shore and he was welcomed by them, these peoples. And his name is preserved in the three great languages of the central culture of the period and time and place. Uh, to the Aztecs, he was Kukulkan. To the, the ones who lived around Palenque, he was Votan. And to the uh, Mayas, he was Quetzalcoatl, uh, the feathered serpent. And this man came from the sea with a bonnet of wonderful plumes, almost like wings. And on his breast he carried a cross. He came to them, and they received him with regard and esteem. And he taught them all the things that Oannes had taught the Chaldeans. He helped them to establish a permanent way of life. He gave them the beginnings of a written language the only written language in the Western Hemisphere. He gave them good government. And then he said, Now I go away. But keep the rules that I have given you. And in due time, I will return and claim the empire. But in the meantime, obey the principles I have taught. And these principles were of very high quality morally and ethically. Then this being went to the shores of the sea. And as he stood there, he said to the people that had assembled that a very bad power was coming to them. Tezcatlipoco, the god of war, was going to come from the south to destroy their empire. They should be true, however. They should keep the rules and then he would return. Then there are two accounts of what happened to him. One that he called to the sea, and the raft of serpents returned. 
the raft of serpents could well have been a ship uh, with the very animal heads and so forth that were engraved and written or painted or carved on the heads of ships. The other explanation is that he was transfigured and rose to become uh, immortalized and, de and deified in the planet Venus. He said, I will come back. But he never came. And when the Spaniards arrived many centuries later, and their ships were anchored, the Aztec Emperor Montezuma took the plumes on the crowns, took all the symbols of regal regality, and sent them by ambassador to Cortes, saying that he was Quetzalcoatl returned, and that therefore he was returning the kingdom which his people had kept tr trustworthy for ages. Now, these stories are interesting. There's nothing you can do but remember these strange stories. The same story exists in China. In China, the world's reformation, the restoration of humanity was the result of a mysterious being who came out of a fish's mouth and rising out of the sea taught them the secrets of life. In India, Vishnu, in his first incarnation, is born from the fish's mouth. Everywhere the, the sea was the source of instruction. Something came from the sea. We can't dogmatize what it is, but it is interesting that at a remote period, certainly eight or ten thousand years ago, if not more, doctrines and concepts and beliefs reached all parts of the world and are still reserved and preserved in all the mythologies, legends, and allegories of ancient peoples and were, and were, <coughs> were recognized as the ultimate source of civilization. Now, if these were missionaries, travelers, philanthropists from the Atlantean Empire, they might have wished to come back. They might have said that they would, or that others would follow. And then came the deluge. The center of the great wheel was destroyed. No one could come back. Little by little, these peoples in different areas modified their beliefs. Interracial minglings brought about complications of stories concerning the descent of knowledge. Here in the, uh, in the southwest of the United States, they have the legends that originally humanity lived under the earth. And a deluge came under the earth. And this deluge uh, threatened the life of everything that lived. So humanity crawled up or climbed up to this outer, upper world upon corn stalks and began to populate the earth. And the point where they came out of the earth is still sacred to the Navajo and the Hopi. Uh, years ago, I had the privilege of bringing to California, temporarily as my guest, one of the last of the great sand painters of the Navajo, Hostine Claude. A few weeks ago, when I was in Sedona, in Arizona, I mentioned Claw, and everyone knew who he was. One of the greatest men of his time, an Indian, and a remarkable person. At that time, when he was up there, we had just published our large book, and I wanted him to see it. He spoke no English. He had no idea of what the book was about. So I turned to the t plate of the table of Hermes, just in passing along through the book. You'll find it if you have it. And the old Indian stopped right there. It was Chaldean. He didn't know what Chaldean was, never heard of it. But he st uh, told me through Haskanaswood, his interpreter, long, long ago, my people could read this. American Indian. Every once in a while, something like this happens, and no one knows why. But it all adds up to something that is very unusual and very interesting. I think if we follow all of the traditions that exist, we would summarize the highest terminal aspect of Atlantean culture as a very high culture. With scientific knowledge, 
with good map making, with many types of industry, arts and sciences, accredited as having the first to domesticate the horse, with hospitals and clinics, and with various types of locomotion, and according to the old stories, the Atlanteans had the secret of flying through the air. We can doubt all these things. We don't know for certain. But we do know that there was on this planet at least 12, 15, 50,000 years ago because the Atlantean disfusion and its empires probably lasted for better than 200,000 years before the final destruction of Posidonis, that there was a great civilization. One of the Hindu scriptures says, referring to the earth, the great mother has shaken many civilizations from her back. And maybe Atlantis was one of them. Maybe Lemuria was another. Perhaps Hyperborea was another. But in any event, far back, there were forms of life and culture very different from what we have today, which destroyed themselves by the misuse of the spiritual powers of life. So now we come to another interesting episode. In the last few years, there's been a great deal of emphasis upon extra terrestrials visiting our planet. Books have been written to show that somebody from outer space, presumably, who came here long ago, produced all kinds of mysterious monuments, records, engravings, pictures, and carvings, are supposed to have, are supposed to have had airplanes, all this type of thing, and it was said to have come somewhere from outer space. The outer space theory has certain difficulties involving it, which have not been completely solved, and may not be solved. I don't know. It may all be true. But what we seemingly have overlooked is the possibility that these records that we now consider to arise from extraterrestrial sources could be the records of the great civilizations that were here before they destroyed themselves. That these people who are said to have come and brought all the secrets of life to these primitive peoples could have been the citizens of the great Atlantic Empire, the empire that was far higher and far more advanced in many ways even than we are today. Their civilization was different. They were not bound to, tremendously to an industrial program. They didn't need it. And we wouldn't need it if we developed the resources within ourselves. The idea that we have to run the planet the way we're running it now simply means that we do not recognize that within ourselves are the answers to the questions that we now find so difficult. That actually, if we use the interior potential we have, we would have no need of all the problems of depressions and all the mysteries of exploitation that we suffer from today. How would it be to imagine for a moment at least that these so-called visitors were actually the Atlanteans. There is a long story of their activities, whereas the story concerning extraterrestrials is rather dim and hard to put together. We base the extraterrestrial idea on one point alone, namely that something was brought here or came here at a time before it would seem possible that the human being could have developed or evolved these resources. They believe, some believe, that they brought with them electric batteries. Others believe that they wore space suits. Some say they came in space ships. But none of these things really exist to our minds except in the form of paintings and carvings and imageries of one kind or another. The main foundation of our belief is that something happened by which a culture came here or was here prior to our ability to trace its source. If we assume that there was a great source already here, 
it would simplify a number of matters and make it much easier to account for the travel of these mysterious visitors. Suppose these mysterious visitors were simply part of an advanced culture here. Uh, I think we have the same thing in, in, the, in problems today. There are still areas in this planet right now where it is very dangerous for, for strangers to go. There are still primitive peoples who have no idea whatsoever of civilization and have never heard of it. And in spite of the tremendous spread of our way of life, there are large areas which have not been touched, or so lightly as to mean very little. If in a more ancient time, most of the planet consisted of comparatively primitive peoples, and the uh, last of the great Atlantean diffusion, Posidonis, was an isolated island, separated by water from practically all other areas on Earth. Most people living in other parts of the planet would have no knowledge of it, or if they had a knowledge, it would only be a legend, and perhaps the legend is responsible for another series of interesting beliefs. The World Mountain, Olympus, uh, Asgard of the Nordic peoples, the whole series of the demigods, the demigods who walked with men, the individuals who had apparently supreme power. Montezuma bowed down to them, and they were Spaniards in armor. And Montezuma believed from reports that these men were centaurs, half man and half horse, and was not able to understand that these men were riding horses, which the Indians knew nothing about. Here, less than 500 years ago, we have a situation in which a higher cultured civilization moved in on a primitive one and was mistaken for gods until they proved that instead of being gods, they were ravishers of the earth. So, in that type of thinking, we might also find a source for much of our religious thinking. These mysterious priests of the ser serpent of the city of the sun, these priests were undoubtedly wise in the mysteries of life. The ancient rites and mysteries of the Greeks and Romans and Egyptians, the secret and esoteric teachings that have descended to us from unknown antiquity, may very well have originated among the esotericists of Atlantis. There also seems to be quite a little evidence to the effect that when the great decision was made and the gods decreed that the Atlanteans had destroyed themselves, and must be removed from the earth, that prophets arose among them in those last days before the end. And these prophets warned them, warned the people that they had disobeyed the gods, that they had sacrificed all that was good for selfishness, avarice, and power. And these prophets led certain groups of the Atlanteans away from Atlantis and into what is now Europe and the Near East. These peoples survived. As this migration occurred at least twelve to 15,000 years ago, we have some suspicion that many of the civilizations of the Near East and perhaps even of the Far East originated among these transplanted peoples who had gone away from the cause of death. It is stated in the Atlantic story that a great number of the gods of Egypt were, uh, we'll say, refugees from Atlantis. That the uh, gods of the Egyptians were Atlantean deities who originally, perhaps, actually and physically lived as leaders of their peoples. In any event, the idea that the world was populated in one sense by refugees is not uh, unreasonable. Another story of the same type which is 
found in many parts of the world, states that the Atlanteans earned their final destruction by an attempt to invade Europe that they raised a great army and sent it against Europe and North Africa. And this great army was on the march and was in these areas claiming them when the Central Islands were destroyed. Therefore, these armies could not return. There was no place to go back to. And many of them settled and mingled with the peoples of these areas to form some of these wonderful and mysterious civilizations which we have no real explanation for. We have very little explanation for how racial differentiation in recent times came about. Uh, the uh, various anthropologists and so forth have charts showing what happened. But as is the case in mo most of science, <coughs> no one seems to know how it happened, or why it happened. These things occurred. New bloodstreams came forth, mingled and mixed and intertwined. And each one brought with it part of its own culture. And these parts of, of ancient cultures seem to linger on, perhaps in lingual differences, in arts and crafts, in psychological structures, in habits and principles and even to a measure in bodily form and structure. In any event, uh, as Bacon points out, we have a challenge coming to us at the present time. And this challenge is more or less documented in terms of Atlantis, and I think this is the way Plato originally used it. You know, the story of Plato's Atlantis ends in the middle of a sentence. It was never completed. Bacon's new Atlantis ends in the middle of a sentence. It was never completed. Why? We don't seem to know. But I think that Bacon tells us about the importance of it, that the, dis the destruction of Atlantis as left by the tables of Enoch is this great story of the disaster of disobedience. That regardless of how we think about life or what we believe about life, it is impossible for us to go contrary to the will of heaven. Anything that goes contrary comes in the end to destruction. Plato and several others of the earlier writers also seems, seems to fat, fat, uh, fabulize this particular situation. Atlantis may be the submerged self in each of us. This is a, an interesting possible thought from a psychological standpoint. The psyche it may be that part of our nature which alone bears witness to its ancient origin. If there is a record of disobedience and penalty, that record is probably primarily descending within the structure of the human being himself. It is something hidden in his own darkness. It is something that may bring him fear. It may bring him conscience. It may warn him of the dangers of the abuse of power and energy. And if so, it may be the submerged part of man's own nature, that part which was lost because of disobedience to the gods. This may be the large, deep, all-spreading mystery of the fall of man, which has been also recorded in various ways among practically all peoples of the earth. Atlantis also seems to have an, a very great fascination uh, for, the, for the psychologist and the social reformer. Is it true that a civilization existed long ago which knew what we do not know today. Is there something lost in our way of life because it disappeared under the waters of the Atlantic so far back in our story? Is it true that there were giants upon the earth in those days, mental giants, that had skills and abilities uh, which they had derived from the studies 
of esoteric matters. Did black magic originate in Atlantis? It probably did, according to the Platonic uh, discussion, because it was in Atlantis that for the first time man disobeyed the gods. And from disobedience fell the angels. The entire story of human progress, so-called, is today very largely a record of disobedience. The individual has broken the rules of life. Some people, having broken the rules of life, try to study esoteric matters, hoping to find the secrets of some strange magic of long ago. But if they are those who have broken the rules, and they are seeking a knowledge which they do not deserve, and which they do not have the character to use constructively, they could cause another deluge upon the face of the earth. Therefore, every effort apparently has been made in ancient times to protect the secrets of essential knowledge. There are records of uh, legends and accounts everywhere of secret teachings, esoteric schools. There are accounts of ways by which the human being can develop faculties and powers at present beyond his capacity. The uh, scoffer says the whole thing is superstition, that there are no such forces, but that isn't, pro isn't proven by scoffing. It is only proving by testing. I remember years ago, when I went, was in India, I met an old gentleman who might make the hero of a book called The Guru. This old gentleman was a guru. I was never a disciple of his or anything of that kind, but I did know him. And uh, we've talked about many things relating to the yoga, Vedanta, Tantra of India. These secret arts which are said to have been given to the world by the gods in ancient times. And in talking about it, you see this old gentleman was sitting there very quietly on a little white square like a sheet in his room in a, a little stucco house in, in Calcutta. He was sitting there in his, in about 11 feet of his own hair. So I said to him, um, I said, uh, I'm going back to the States and as one of the holy men of India, have you a message you'd like to have carried to the American people? And the old gentleman, sitting in the midst of his hair, where it joined his head, it was pure white, at the outer ends it was black, looked me straight in the eyes and said, yes, there is. Tell the American people to be practical. That sounds like a very strange thing to say under the conditions. Because if there ever was anything that ever looked impractical, it was what he was doing. So I carried that question a little further. And he explained to me, he said, um, I'll, I would like to make a recommendation. He says, send over to us five or ten of your best equipped scientists, the ones who have the greatest knowledge that your academies and schools, universities, and institutions can produce. Leave them with us for ten years and they will reform Western wisdom. We have built it all on the outside, when in fact we have failed in the greatest mystery of all, the realization that within ourselves are the secrets we are searching for everywhere else. And also within ourselves are energy resources which cannot be exhausted and that there can be and should be an over-science of life by means of which human beings could build a world that would endure, a world that would be worth living in for everyone who lives here. Now, the old masters of the magic of Atlantis lost all by perversion. They lost themselves and they lost their lives. They lost their world and their beautiful cities and their temples. Nothing remained because they failed. Now at the moment, 
we can also remember, remind again of the Atlantis of Bacon, namely what we have to do. He said, Bacon in the New Atlantis said that the, we might say the motto of the great Atlantean experiment was that man should learn to know all that is possible for man to know and should dedicate Nothing remained because they failed. Now at the moment, we can also remember, remind again of the Atlantis of Bacon, namely what we have to do. He said, Bacon in the New Atlantis said that the, we might say the motto of the great Atlantean experiment was that man should learn to know all that is possible for man to know and should dedicate all he knows to the unselfish good of all that lives. Now, it's a pretty big order and we're not working that way too well at the moment but the principles still remain true that when the individual works for himself his empires fall. When he works for the common good he builds that in which is the spirit of everlastingness. Now among the mysteries that have been involved in the Atlantean story are the pyramids. And the pyramids are very interesting things. We know that they are in Egypt, we know that they are in Central America, but recent, not I say recently, a year or two ago, I saw photographs, aerial photographs, of pyramids in the heart of China which are not generally known, but they've been recognized. These pyramids, like the mounds of antiquity, seemingly have a meaning. And what that meaning is appears to be also rather uncertain. According to the conservative Egyptologists, and Mayaologists for that matter, the pyramids were simply magnificent monuments to the memories of dead pharaohs, kings, or emperors, or, if you want to be a little more idealistic, perhaps the testimonies to God and wisdom. But the pyramids are very strange things. Their distribution upon the surface of the earth is most extraordinary. Work is now being done, and I hope it will be carried on to a successful conclusion, to study and chart the locations of pyramids in relation to the magnetic fields of the planet. We know that the planet is a kind of crystal, that it has areas of fission, that it has magnetic fields, and that these magnetic fields are very important to the survival of life and to the distribution of energies. These magnetic fields may sometimes be, sometime be the substitute for every method of locomotion or all forms of uh, fuel in the world today. Uh, I, went, I went to the Pyramid of Giza and I went through all the interior chambers of it. And there are some things about it that are very, very strange. Why should a tomb be ventilated? There are two great passageways leading from the king's chamber to the outside wall of the pyramid. They are like ventilators, not large enough for a person to go through, but large enough to permit a current of air. And then, after some time, no one knows when, the outer ends of these ventilators were blocked. But the openings to the inside are still open. The Great Pyramid King's Chamber has in the ceiling the largest stone, I guess, in the entire structure. It weighs many, many tons. The sarcophagus, so-called, has been largely nicked away by tourists. But there is a lighter stone box, much in the shape of a casket, but too small for a human body. The way the Egyptians mummified their dead and put one mummy case and sarcophagus and over another before a final interring in the stone vaults 
could not have been done in this case at all. It would have been utterly impossible. You know, so another interesting thing happened. Way back in the days of the glory of Baghdad, uh, the great uh, sultan uh, of the, uh, the the follower and descendant of, so, of the uh, great uh, El Rashid of the Arabian Nights, the Sultan El Rashid Ben Mamun, decided to open the Great Pyramid. He had been told that it was built by giants who were called the Shaddai, superhuman beings, and that within that pyramid and those pyramids they had stored a great treasure beyond the knowledge of man. So, taking his court with him, the Sultan went to Egypt, and he stood and looked at the great pyramid. <coughs> and at that time, all the casing stones were in place. The four walls were perfectly smooth. There was no visible opening of any kind. And he didn't know exactly what to do. But he heard from legends where he supposed the entranceway was, and he began to dig there. And they had a very fine way of digging in those days, which I think we have improved on. They had to use cold chisels and vinegar to go through the stone. And when they got through a certain way, they did find that they had come very close to an entrance. But a great stone blocked it. And they could go no further. The sultan, or caliph, looked at the stone. He said, take it out. So they went to work on that stone with vinegar and very soft metal tools. And last for the great trouble, they managed to get the stone out. And as they took it out, another stone fell in its place. And they had to go through stone after stone before they could get into the building. Now, you don't do that just to bury a fairy hole. And at last, when they got all the way in, there was nothing. The only thing they found were a series of little implements, like a little... Uh, a ball that would, could be used to make sure a surface was even. If you stood the ball on it, if it rolled off, the surface wasn't even. And two or three other little tools. And, and the dimensions of the building itself. Now the Shaddai, Shaddai was supposed to have buried all this treasure. Did they really bury a treasure in there? Were those little instruments the treasure? And were the dimensions of the of the pyramid and its interior structure this priceless secret that was far more important than gold? It has been worked on. Some have decided that the Great Pyramid was a great book of prophecy. Some say that it was built by the Atlanteans. Some say that it has the most perfect mathematical um, form and the great most perfect measurements of anything on earth. They have measured the orientation of the pyramid and it's oriented up to the eighth or ninth decimal point. And the little error that does exist, just a little fragmentary error, is probably due to the fact there was a minor earthquake that shook off that corner. The building was built by somebody who knew a great deal. Now if you only want to go back as far as Cheops or Khufu, we have to admit under those conditions that the Egyptians were pretty smart people. Because if they built the pyramid, they had a knowledge not only of architecture, but a knowledge of mathematics, and a knowledge of astronomy, and a knowledge of geography that was prodigious. They knew more about all of these subjects than we knew a hundred years ago. Something in this story is another evidence that somewhere in the past there was a very great amount of knowledge. And if it was true, or is true, that the pyramid was oriented to the star of Aga, then the entire history of Egyptian philosophy and mathematics is set forth in that building. The Egyptians themselves, at a very early time, said that the great pyramid of Giza, pyramid number one, 
was originally the tomb of Hermes. And that in that, in that building was the great key to the Hermetic philosophy, which was restored in Alexandria in the first century. Now Hermes, as the Hermetic tradition tells us, was the god of wisdom. Uh, a sp being known to the Greeks as Hermes, known to the Romans as Mercury, known to the Egyptians as Thoth, the god of, wi of writing. And uh, the last poem, by the way, of Longfellow, was an ode to Hermes, in which he said, Trismegistus, three times greatest, how thy name sublime has descended to this latest progeny of time. Hermes Trismegistus, the, em the embodiment of all knowledge that is knowable of nature. Hermes was the symbol of cosmic mind, of absolute knowledge. He was de uh, described as having written all the books of the world, because every book was written by mind. He was the keeper of the great secrets of life, the guardian of the mysteries. And uh, this uh, work includes a discussion of the great pyramid. Certain hermetic books, probably written about the first century, but credited with a greater antiquity, include a work written by Hermes, presumably, to his son Tatian. And he says in this book to his son, he says, The day shall come when Egypt shall be no more glorious, that nothing will remain of this great empire except broken columns half covered by the sand. And that was written over 2,000 years ago from existing manuscripts. So the entire problem of Egypt ties into Atlantis through the pyramids and other ancient monuments. Let's see now what we could say about this pyramid in study of man at the present stage of his evolution. For some reason, we're not very sure of, the pyramid is on the reverse of the seal, the great seal of the United States. No one knows exactly why it was put there. No one knows who it put it there. The custodian of the great seal, back about the turn of the century, wrote a book on the story of the Great Seal of the United States. And he said the reverse of the seal, the front of course is the eagle, the reverse of the seal has never been cut for the reason that it is nothing but the dull symbol of an esoteric society. Well, that esoteric society, of course, numbered among its followers, Washington, Franklin, probably Jefferson, but in any event the seal was not cut. Now, the soldiers of the Revolutionary War were paid their wages in what we would term uh, feudatory notes. They were simply local printing paper with practically no value. Nearly everyone who fires the Revolution went broke. But these little notes that were passed around, one of them has that pyramid on it before it was on the seal of the United States. And later it was moved onto the states in a paper. Now, when was the great seal cut? It has been cut. It was cut during the presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt and has since been found on the reverse of our dollar bill. This seal is apparently the symbol of a monument, a monument which, according to the Bible, was set up in Egypt to bear testimony. It was quite possible, and people are beginning to work more and more on it, that the study of the pyramid is very, very important to the solution of our relationship to the ancient world. We like to think in our own way that we are just here to do as we please, that we can make the mistakes we like best, that there is no definite providence to guide us, that our ancestors are all dead, 
and that nothing was better than the Roman Empire. But we are not at all sure of some of these attitudes. And as our own problems increase, as they are increasing today, it becomes very obvious that we are not able to handle our own destinies at this time. We do not know where we are going. We have no idea of how we're going to get there. And about the only thing we can do at the present time is try to figure out how we can add more guns or bombs than somebody else as the basis of survival. Now, this doesn't really make very good sense. It is not the answer. There is a grand plan of life, a grand purpose. It has existed among every people, and every nation has finally turned away from it and then and disappeared. The ruins of the past are a constant record of the individual's inhumanity to man and his failure to keep the principles of his own survival. The science of survival, then, suggests that there must be a plan and that that plan must be available to man if he wants it or is willing to do that which is necessary to have it. If he is not, he will not get it. Now, there's an interesting story we don't hear much about also. Hermes, among the books which he is attributed as having written, was one which was called the Black Book. Now, the Black Book is another legend. <coughs> Very difficult to find much out about it. But one thing we know is that in England, the Order of the Garter was formed not because of an accident to a lady's garter, but because the original meaning of the word, as it appears, and was gradually, uh, we might say, uh, colloquialized. It was the order of the garter, the protector. And if you have visited the chapel of the garter at Windsor, you will see the thrones of those who were the members of the order. And according to the ancient order, as recorded by its first great historian, Sir Lias Ashmole, back in the 17th century, the original laws and rules for the order were taken from the Black Book of Hermes on the, on the deportment of kings. And uh, the entire structure is so constituted and the thrones are so arranged that it represents really a heavenly temple in which all the gods of antiquity were seated. It is also a very appropriate symbol of the first great League of Nations, that it was a symbol of the union of the rulers of the world for the maintenance of peace. The Knights of the Garter were all rulers, and I remember when I looked at it, there up on the flag of banner of the, of the chairs was the flag of the Emperor of Japan. The Order of the Garter was an international order of leadership. And the Knights of the Garter, in their rights, drew their swords, overlapped them, and formed together a circle of blades resembling a great star. The, the Knights of the Garter were sworn to the protection of the weak, to the justice that is in the power of the ruler to bestow and that all together, each in his own way and in his own faith, took his obligation to the God of his fathers to keep the peace. Then something happened. The black book disappeared. And the parts which had not been transcribed, which had to do with the rules of conduct down through time, have never been found. Again, something mysterious happened but that it did exist, Ashmole assures us. The same type of thing comes with the order of the, of the round table. Another type is with the legends of Charlemagne. All of these things go way, way back, but they all lead to one concept, namely that there is an over-government of the world, 
that this over-government is the government of the gods from their Olympian thrones as personifications of the great forces of life by which the universe is maintained. We do not have to believe in Olympian deities, but the integrities which they stand for or symbolize are the basis of human life. And unless these integrities are maintained, nations will fall. And every nation up to the present time has passed through great vicissitudes because of its inability uh, to keep the rules of life. In the Greek and Egyptian worlds, those who were dedicated to trying to live a better life were gradually accepted into the mysteries. And these mysteries were among the things that Solon participated in when he was initiated into the rites of, the, uh, of Osiris and Isis. According to the legend, Solon was taken into the basement or cellars of the temple. He was taken way down under the earth by the side of the Nile. And in the very depths of the earth, there was a subterranean lake. And it was all black and dark. And on the shore of the lake was a little boat with a blind oarsman. And in the center of the lake was a small island. <coughs> and on this small island were the two pillars of Enoch. So Solon and the priest who guided him went out to the island and the priest showed him these strange hieroglyphic writings on these columns. And it described how various destructions had afflicted the world. And it said that the Atlantean Empire was destroyed by water. But if the solution wasn't found, if the world did not become aware from the ancient evidence and from daily living that there was no way of breaking the rules of living and surviving, then another great civilization might rise. And if this one rose, and it was necessary to punish it, it would be punished by forces moving in the air. Solon took this back. Didn't know how exactly what to do with it. But he realized that he had been in the presence of something very sacred. That the priests themselves believed this. And it was written on this column of indestructible metal that had been there before the dawn of time. Incidentally, there is a column in India that is much the same. It's in Delhi. It just looks like a pillar rising out of the ground, oh, maybe nine or ten feet, maybe eight or nine inches in diameter with a kind of a colophon on the top, and inscriptions in language that no one can read. No one has ever been able to read. It looks like iron. But during the Sepoy Rebellion, that column was hit by a number of solid shot cannonballs. The cannonballs were broken into fragments, and there was not even a dent on the column. It is believed that this column also goes to the story of the Orichalcum, upon of which the walls of Atlantis were built. Everywhere you trace around, you find interesting things to remind us of something. And I think what it's trying to tell us is that we are one step in a great project, a project that leads from the primitive to the ultimately enlightened. That all along the way, just as human beings are young, grow old, and pass out of embodiment, generation after generation passes, so nations after nations come and go. The great thread of life is never broken, but there can never be an enduring culture until it keeps the rules. And these are the same rules that Plato tells us about that Solon found, namely that we are surrounded by a tremendous field of energy. 
We are surrounded by the potentials we have no knowledge of. Space is full of the energies and life that we are trying to now find by artificial means. The human body is an incredible instrument, and it's, been dis its value has been largely destroyed by the fact that the owner of the body is unwilling to treat it properly. So nation after nation rises and goes down because it does not keep the rules. And this will continue until man, in one way or another, becomes aware of these rules. Now, the speculation about the Atlantic story, to my mind, should not be where was it and what was it, primarily. But the main question is to find out what the story means and how it, what it means to us today to make this idea practical. We learn from this story, for instance, that a great civilization can perish. We learn that great empires can fall. But what we haven't learned really is that these disasters are caused largely by the corruptions of the human beings. That man himself is his own destroyer. And that he will be along his own destroyer as long as he follows the ambitions of world domination, as long as he lives to conquer peoples, as long as he lives to accumulate an unreasonable wealth, where he is willing to, to compromise integrity for fame, where he is willing to live only for today and let tomorrow take care of itself. He should look back and see how the tomorrow of Atlantis took care of itself. The individual himself sickens and dies from his own corruptions. Nations do the same thing. But in every nation that perishes, something survives. And one of the things that survives is a knowledge. A knowledge which can be reorganized, reintegrated, and reformed. We have gained from the past many skills and many wonders. But these are not enough unless we ensoul them. We can gain any skill we want. As today, we are working with computers. We can have all the computers we want. But men will be born and suffer and die just the same unless we use these computers to solve the great problems of life. And having found that those answers can be discovered, live by them when they are found. All knowledge has as its final purpose that the individual shall overcome his own ignorance and that society shall overcome its compound ignorance. And ignorance is nothing but the belief that we can break the rule and survive. So the Atlanteans left us this message, the Mayas left it to us, that the great world patterns, the great world systems with which we are concerned have all perished from one source. We call it ignorance. And it is ignorance in a sense, because as the Chinese point out, any individual who does wrong is ignorant. No matter how learned he is, no matter how many years he's spent in school, no matter how many honors have been bestowed upon him, no matter how much wealth he has accumulated, if he has not the understanding of the importance of complete integrity, he is ignorant. Ignorance is the inability to use wisely what the skills of the mind have given us. And until we realize this, we will be perishable. And just like the Atlantis of old, we shall be teetering on the edge of oblivion unless we ourselves make the necessary changes in our concepts and our conducts. Bacon pointed out that there was, in the great city of the new Atlantis, in Solomon's house, there was a tremendous collection of all of the arts and sciences that man had known. That in here, all the wisdom, all the value that humanity had accumulated was in a great museum, a wonderful place, a gallery. And also here were the busts and statues and portraits of the great illumines, 
those who had given man the great donations and gifts of wisdom. Here was made available to the individual the accumulated wisdom of the ages. Everything of astronomy, of medicine, of art, of literature, everything of science. So, each one coming into the world comes into this gallery and here he sees all that the world has done, all the achievements of the past, and then he is reminded of the simple fact. You have seen all these things. You know they have been accomplished. Therefore, your problem is to take these things and use them for the good of all that lives. Unless somebody somewhere along the line comes to this conclusion and takes this attitude towards all knowledge, the dangers of the deluge remain. The danger that we will tear down or lose a tremendous asset by abusing its use. Actually, it is the same in our personal lives. Unless we control our minds and emotions, unless we uh, organize and rectify character and conduct, we are abusing the priceless privilege of growing, which is our birthright. And those who have abused the birthright get into trouble. So Atlantis stands for a lost cause, not lost because the gods merely wanted to destroy a people. Atlantis was destroyed because it was too dangerous to let it live. It meant that if it was not destroyed, evil would spread throughout the world, would afflict all peoples, would tyrannize and dominate and corrupt everything that exists. Before this can happen, so many laws are broken, so many energies are abused, that all these broken rules of these abused energies get together and destroy the source of the corruption. Just as evil creatures, bacillus, virus, and all these things, come and destroy bodies that have been made infirm. So in the Atlantic story, we have a moral lesson of importance, in addition to a fascinating ancient fable. Thank you very much.